I see you're joining us from the library today. That's right. Before we get to the movie, I want to talk about a huge pet peeve of mine. It involves DVDs, which I'm watching a lot of lately. Yes. I hate DVD menus that show you scenes from the movie you're about to watch. That's horrible. I have your DVD. It's in my DVD player. I'm about to watch your movie. You don't need to sell it anymore. The first time I saw a DVD menu that was poetry was when I got the Godfather trilogy and every single DVD menu was one still shot of the movie. Like a shot of the abandoned car, grain is slightly moving. It's gorgeous and it doesn't give away anything. It doesn't, you don't know someone was just killed. And if you do, you don't know who was just killed. You don't know if cannolis were taken or left. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm gonna spring one on you. It might be good, it might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Tonight's movie is all about huge public gatherings. Some of the hugest public gatherings that have ever been assembled are sporting contests. Baseball, football, football. <gasps> Did I say football twice? Is there another type of football? Yes, there is. We know it as soccer. Tonight, we're also going to be doing a little traveling as we take a trip across the pond to catch a match featuring the Damned United. Released in 2009, TDU stars Michael Sheen, Colm Meany, and Jim Broadbent. It was directed by Tom Hooper, who would go on to bigger and better things. Based on the novel of mostly the same name, this is an interpretation of the story of Brian Clough's tenure as football manager of Leeds United. Clough's widow Barbara and the entire Clough family were very critical of what they saw as inaccuracies in the book. They refused to go to the premiere and vowed never to watch the film. We should check in on them. It's been 11 years. Maybe one of them snuck out to watch it. <laughs> I want to see what Tom Hooper does outside the realm of musicals. Unless, do you think there's a song? <laughs> I doubt it. Now, why did I choose this? Is it because I'm a soccer fan? Not really. Is it because a generous viewer sent the DVD to us? Possibly. Is it because I have the perfect gift? Probably. It's this. Is that an action figure? This is a soccer star. He's not a member of Leeds United. It's Guido Buchwald. My favorite Italian-German player. This has been in the cabinet for so many years. Just waiting for the perfect movie. And to our viewers worldwide, I will endeavor for this episode to call it football. But I might slip up. So lace up your cleats and charge across the... They don't wear cleats, do they? I really don't know. So lace up your football shoes and put pads all over your sensitive areas and charge across the field to the old leather couch where we are going to score as we watch The Damned United. Damned. What's that, Guido? You want me to talk about the movie? Well, okay. It's 1974 and merry old ridden. A one-year-old Matt Sloan is completely oblivious to this team. And a 46-year-old Matt Sloan also pretty oblivious to this team. Assume a new, a young with perhaps new ideas and a tracksuited man. A what? Don Revy is retiring as the manager of the Leeds United Football Club. When one man leaves, another steps into his place. Just like in Thunderdome. What's new, pussycats? Whoa, whoa. What's new, pussycats? Whoa, whoa. His replacement is Brian Clough. He does a TV interview and he's really cocky the entire time. He's excited to get the job at Leeds, but he thinks the Leeds players kind of play dirty and cheat. And he doesn't think much of their former coach, Don Revy. You'll be without Peter Taylor for the first time. Oh, that guy. That guy's in every British movie made. That guy. We've accused the players of dirty tactics, uh, cheating, dissent. Filthy underwear. Beyond me, they can experience what it's like to be in a happy family after all. Like the Ramones. He says a bunch of things that he probably shouldn't say, but he's Brian Clough, and he is brimming with confidence and not driven by revenge or hubris at all. He goes to the stadium. But the board of Leeds United is not happy with his recent television appearance. He's entitled to his opinions. I'm entitled to mine. And I'm entitled to mine. And I'm entitled to mine. And I'm entitled nine. Brian Clough, Uber, fucking Alice. 
You know, we all fought in the war. We don't um, appreciate that Uber Alice line. Perhaps it goes back to something that happened six years ago. At that point, Clough is managing a team in Darby. Darby is at the bottom of Division Two. His right-hand man is Pete Taylor. That's the guy. Oh, Timothy Spall. And the chairman of the club is Sam Longson. I don't know how English football works, but through some random process, Darby is matched up with Leeds United. Leeds! 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 The Glengarry Leeds! This is how they can prove that they are a legitimate team. All I know is that I hope he changes this wallpaper. There's far too many vaginas on it. I think this is the part of England where every sperm is sacred. Don Revy. My bird is a superstitious twat. Superstitious twat would be a terrible name for a psychic. <laughs> he goes and he scrubs down the stadium himself. He wants everything to be perfect. Gets a nice bottle of wine. Whenever I go to the store and I want the finest wine, I say, show me to your dustiest bottles. He's looking forward to meeting Don Revy. The Leeds team arrives. Don Revy gets off the bus and he won't even shake Brian Clough's hand. He ghosts him. And a grudge was born. The match happens and Darby loses because Leeds is playing dirty. And again, manager Revy comes over and completely snubs Clough. We need a ringer, someone who's going to win us matches. I know someone, Dave Mackay. He's one of the best players in England. He's the one, Brian. He's the chosen one. The one prophesied in the Derby Council meeting of 1964. He's about to sign with this other team, but if we go over there on Sunday, maybe we can get him to sign with us. So they head on down to London, having a merry old time in their car. Matt, I've driven you around a lot of times and you've never fed me anything while driving. They keep bringing in all these really good players. Faster! Faster! Thing of fucking beauty! With Dave McKay on their team, Darby starts to win games and they end up winning the Division II Championship. Try, try, try and separate that. It's an illusion. It's an illusion. Try, try, try and you will only come. To a contusion. Me to be named English Manager of the Year really is a dream come true. Oh, another thorn in Brian Clough's ass. Next year, they'll be in the First Division. Ho oh, ho, Don Revy, I'm coming for you. Back in the present, Brian Clough meets with his team. Everyone wear more purple, wear more purple, yada da 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 I predict that at some point this man will be referred to as a ginger git. He tells them that all of their championships and all of their trophies are worthless because you've done it all by bloody cheating. I'm going to train you guys to play good football. The team doesn't seem very thrilled at this announcement. Particularly the team captain, Billy Bremner. And you, Irishman. I need you to kill Jimmy Hoffa. Mr. Revy never made us do that. I don't like Don Revy. I want all of you to forget the name Don Revy. He can't actually play soccer. I can. Check it out. And they're quite brutal with him. Oh! Oh! Hey! oh, right in the cloth. Back we go to 1969. Darby is playing Leeds again. Darby loses again. We need a ball player. Not a belly itcher. Oh. Pete locates a player named Colin Todd, and this guy is really good. Socks off, socks off. Come on, guys, get on the field. The game's already started. There's no goalie. It's 140 to zero. <laughs> Clough is so nervous he can't even watch the game. He just sits in his office beneath the stands, listening to the crowds. Don't get your hopes up, Brian. They're cheering for the other team. That's how bad your team is. I should have bought tickets for this game. What kind of manager am I? Ah, the old frowny fake-out. Ca casting, I was about to say casting. Hiring this new ringer makes them win their next game. They end up winning the Division I championship. Ole, 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 ole. I wouldn't say I was the best manager in the country, uh, but I'm in the top one. <laughs> Back to 1974 in Leeds. <laughs> Save all the children's flags. Now we'll get big and bad. We've got seven seas. 
Let's get the game. For those of you watching overseas, those are the American lyrics to this song. And Leeds is still playing dirty. Not only are they still playing dirty, they're losing. A particularly dirty player is Billy Bremner. Your conduct in the charity shield match was deplorable. Can you tell how furious I am with you? The Council of Football <laughs> are so disappointed with him, they fine him and suspend him for six weeks. Suspended for 11 bloody games. And when Leeds takes the field, the games are especially bloody. You boogered. You boogered and shagged and rogered. He's missing the most important member of the team, and that's Pete. No, I can't work with you anymore. I can't work with you anymore because i'm mad at you why we'll find that out later we go from 1974 all the way back to 1973 and darby's facing off against leeds again it would be better for the entire league if we lose this game still got an hour before kickoff i'd reconsider if i were you clean the cloth out of your ears the chairman is the boss then comes the directors, then the secretary, then the fans, then the players, and then finally, the fucking manager. Ah! There is a brutal game in the rain and in the mud. One of the teams wins. I don't remember which, but the important thing is that Pete has a heart attack. Hey Pete, I got this idea. We should both tender our resignations. They certainly won't accept them, and they'll know that we mean business. The enemy's not Longston. The enemy is the Nazis. He played Churchill, didn't he? Yeah, everyone's played Churchill. Have I played Churchill? Yes, you have, man. I wrote this letter. You didn't send the letter, did you? Did you? Yes, he did. And unfortunately, the board is more than happy to accept those resignations. There's a public outcry. Oh, I think it's terrible. Thank you, British Graham Parsons. But before a petition can be circulated to get him reinstated, Dave Mackay is given the job. Back in the present, Leeds has lost their first two games. They hire three new players. What's your bait in for? A little poof in a pair of reserves. <laughs> and they lose their next game. There's no more telly. Back in 1973, we're in sunny seaside Brighton. Brichton, the Brighton Football Club, has offered Pete and Brian jobs. They accept the offer and they say, could we just have a couple weeks vacation? While he's having sun and fun, he's approached by Leeds United. They're offering him the job to coach their team. Manage. We call it coaching. In football, it's managing. Pete, let's do it. No, we already told Brighton we were going to sign with them. You're the shop window. I grant you that. The razzle and the bloody dazzle. Okay, You're, not just You're a dummy. You're big and fat, and I don't like you. I'm going to stay here in Brighton. You go off to Leeds. We're for quits. Back in the present, Leeds loses again. Revy shows up at one of the games and he gets a huge round of applause. Something that Brian has never heard in the city of Leeds. Brian's called before the board. He's in trouble. There's no understanding between players and management. Perhaps as your manager, you should hire this man, Guido Buchwald. <laughs> and Brian is fired. Brian goes back on TV to talk about the firing and look who shows up, Don Revy. They're going to be on the same program together. What's your reaction to being sacked in this fashion? I love it! Revy says you were a lousy manager. Yeah, well, you were mean to me six years ago. We're out. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank Mr. Clough, I hope you've been adequately sandbagged. Brian is at rock bottom. It's time to go mend fences with Pete. So down to Brighton he goes with his boys. Pete's working in his garden, seemingly enjoying his life. What do you want? Hey, there's social distancing. <laughs> I want you back. Pete makes him do a little groveling. I apologize, unreservedly, for being a twat. Now they're friends again. Come here, you two. Come here. You twats. Brian and Pete have continued successes. This is what they look like in real life. And they go on to win some championships. Revy, however, fails in his endeavors and ends his career in disgrace. The Damned United. We've watched The Damned United, and I think it's safe to say that this episode is Guido approved. He gives it one kick. How does this movie work as a sports movie? It's a weird one because... It's not about the game, it's about the coach. I think a good sports movie functions on two levels. It gives you the sport in an authentic way, 
And it also gives you what is commonly known as inside baseball. Yes. You get to see behind the scenes of how the structure of the sport works. I have no interest in baseball whatsoever, but I loved Moneyball. And that's a lot of inside base. That's as inside baseball as you can get. So a great sports movie appeals to the fan of that sport and also the fan of just interesting movies. You don't really need to know that much about the sport or care that much about the sport for it to work. When you see the big list of teams and then you see the team moving from the bottom to the top, that's all you need to know. So we still haven't answered the question, how does this work as a sports movie? I think it works just fine. It doesn't seem to be that interested in soccer. What is the climax of the movie? Him going to Brighton to get Pete back on his side. So it's really more about this relationship and one man's rise and fall and his inevitable rise again. You know, this could have been about cricket or it could have been about handball or whatever. Handball, very big in England. And the sport didn't matter at all. It was just about this one cocky, arrogant, but still deserving man. Now, I know you just read Moby Dick, and this is definitely a Moby Dick story. Clow is Ahab, and Revy is the white whale. Not only to defeat, but also to become the person that he's trying to destroy. Get up to the level where he does get Don Revy's respect. How did you feel about the way the movie used time? I would have liked that more if I didn't have to sum up the movie afterwards. I thought it did pretty well. I just saw Little Women, which does the exact same thing. It goes back and forth in time constantly. I have to admit, at points in that movie, I would get a little confused as to if I'm in the past or the present. Wasn't the case here mainly because they would put the year up every time they would go into a flashback or a flash forward. But anyway, yes. it, it, it was still well done the way they teased out the story by telling it out of order. One of the pleasures of this movie is watching Michael Sheen and Timothy Spall work together. Spall is one of the best actors in England now. If you haven't seen Mr. Turner, he's amazing in that. That's an entire life of an actor. There's a line from that movie that I'm, I always think about. Is it meh? He walks among a group of men and he says, what is occurring? That's basically his, what's the rumpus? <laughs> yeah. He did come out as a very, very bad cop right at the beginning. In a way, he's sort of taking revenge on the team when he starts coaching them. Instead of going in there and actually trying to make them a better team, he just goes in and tells them off. He tells them yeah. about all this thing, all this crap that's been simmering inside of him for six years. He ends up falling on his face as a result of it. I'm really happy that we finally have Jim Broadbent on our show. He's one of my favorite character actors. I don't know where I saw him first, but he left such an impression on me that Every time I see him in a movie, I love it. If I were to guess, the first thing you saw him in was probably Brazil. Unless you were watching Black Adder before you saw Brazil, because he has a, at least one great episode of that. Mm. Oh, the Infanta. <laughs> <laughs> so the captain of the Leeds football club is Billy Bremner. And as soon as I heard that name, I wondered, where have I heard that name before? <laughs> Billy Bremner is mentioned in a Monty Python sketch. It's the lead-in to the Dinsdale the Porcupine long sketch about the British Mafia. Is that the one that... Um, Doug and Dinsdale. He nailed my head to the floor. Is that the one where Terry Jones has a thing where he uses community theater acting to great advantage? <laughs> yes. What else do we need to say about this movie? Not a damned United thing. On that note, we've watched The Damned United. We hope you enjoyed it. And now it's time for us to race toward the goal of seeing it. Seen it! In times of quarantine such as these, a nice thing to have on hand is a robust DVD collection. Physical media, it's coming back into style. And that's why today the theme of Seen It is Seen It, Own It. Nutty Nut Nuts writes, have you seen Point Blank with Lee Marvin? I got it right here. I've watched that very DVD myself. That is an amazing movie. It's this bizarre existential revenge plot. Mm -hmm. You kind of can't believe what you're seeing for most of the time. And Lee Marvin gives such a scary performance as this man bent on revenge who kills very few people. Everyone just seems to die around him. Carol O'Connor in a rare film appearance. He's basically the same character as Ned Beatty in Network. Yes. He just shows up and says, what are you doing? But he says it's so like, what are you doing? Not like, ah, but ah. Ian DeLuga writes, I was very surprised by Toy Story 4 after being disappointed by the third installment. First children's movie to bring a tear to my eye since Up. Seen it, own it. Toy Story 1 through 3 is a very powerful trilogy. Mm -hmm. And a very complete trilogy. 
And Toy Story 4 just feels like they're going back to the well. I don't agree with you, and I don't agree with Ian. Toy Story 3 was nominated the same year King's Speech was nominated for Best Picture, and I think it should have won Best Picture. Having thought that the story was over, I realized that there was another story that needed to be completed. Which is? Woody's story. Okay. But really, the greatest thing about Toy Story 4, in my, in my opinion, is Bo Peep, a character that was just kind of a token female character for the first few movies. She is so huge in this movie. I can feel Woody saying, I remember her back when I used to date her and she's changed so much for the better since she left me. And that's a feeling that I've had in my life. So it's something I can really, really identify with. It was nice to see Bo Peep return. But don't you think that the story is very similar to Toy Story 3? There's this central villain who's hurt because they've been abandoned, and so now they become a monster as a result of it. They have an army of sycophants to carry out their things. I mean, she's really very similar to Lotso Hugs from Toy Story 3. Oh, you could say she's also similar to uh, the Prospector guy in Toy Story 2, Kelsey Grammer's role. The difference between those two is that they allow her and the toys help her to have a happy resolution. This next movie is another one that was sent to us by a generous viewer, and now we own it, and it is Whiskey Galore. This is an Ealing Studios comedy directed by Alexander McKendrick, who would go on to direct films such as The Sweet Smell of Success. This comedy needs to translate in two ways. To us. It needs to translate across the decades and across the pond. I think it does, but it's a very much a nod and smile comedy. It takes place during World War II. During whiskey rationing, there's a shipwreck and the shipwreck is filled with whiskey. And so they just all get to have all the whiskey they ever wanted to. I really like the way they portray withdrawal among the Islanders. It, you know, no one gets the shakes, no one gets the DTs. Everyone is just sad. There's no whiskey. What, what's the point of life? <laughs> This is actually a question that was posed by Christopher Mott. Salou, what is your favorite political fiction movie? My favorite is Z by Costa Gavras. I've seen that. It's a political thriller that is really, really thrilling. Uh, almost documentary-like about a political assassination of a popular liberal leader. Uh, he is obviously being silenced by the conservative militaristic government. What country is this? It's never specified. It was filmed, I think, in southern France by a Greek director with an international cast. And so French people are like, oh, this is about France. And Greeks are about, it's about Greeks. And Algerians are like, oh, no, it's about Algiers. It doesn't matter where it's from. It matters what it is. And just the lengths that an oppressive government will go to silence dissent. I watched this six years ago. It was right when I started taking notes about the movies that I watched, uh, which is good because I remember very little of it. But I wrote this about it. A blueprint of the contemporary cinematic language of political intrigue. No. That's some film critic stuff right there. If you want to go someplace where you're guaranteed to win, you can go to our website, welcome to the basement show.com. There are all the episodes in our entire catalog there, and there are PayPal donation buttons that you can click on and donate to support this show. Any amount is welcome. Anyone do that lately? Got a couple of donors here. Andrew, who says, thanks for all the great work, guys. Can you please say the donate is from Natalie Keegan, my sister, who's your biggest fan? Thank you, Andrew and Natalie. And Bill, who says, longtime viewer, first time donor. Hope this helps get you through this weird and unpredictable time. By the way, would love to hear your thoughts on the MacGruber movie. I think it's one of the most underrated comedies of the last decade. I haven't seen that movie, and I actually have never seen a MacGruber sketch. I wasn't really watching SNL during that era, so. They had a really, really bad commercial for the movie. Hmm. It was really, really bad. Did not make me want to see the movie ever. To find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the contents of our mail crate, you can watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. We'd like to thank you for watching, and now watch this. <laughs> I'm coming closer. Closer. It's too close. Hello, Cecil. Cecil, go away. It's more about me. Not right now. There's no relationship. There's no understanding between players and management. I apologize for being a twat.